Hi there, and welcome to Ian's Engage channel. I'm Ian. In a previous video, I explained my updated plan for tackling the tricky bit of track work at the rear of the layout behind the scenic breakboard. In this video, I'm going to show how I've finally begun to put the new plan into action. The first step was to take some accurate measurements for the sections that I wanted to construct away from the layout. To do this, I used the printed track plan that I'd pinned to the form earlier. I used a Sharpie pen to mark positions onto the track plan where I wanted the section brakes to be. I chose the brakes based on where it would be convenient to join the track between adjacent sections. I then realised that because the track plan was pinned to the form, it would be difficult to reposition it to transfer my markings onto the form itself. So, I sellotaped the pieces of track plan together. I could then remove the pins, which allowed me to slightly pull the whole track plan away from the back wall in one piece. With the track plan moved, I could place markings onto the form that coincided with the marked section breaks. This then allowed me to remove the track plan completely and use these markings to draw the section breaks onto the form itself. Once I had the sections marked on the form, I could remove the form from its position on the layout. I then made sure I numbered the sections of form to help me with orientation of the pieces once they'd been cut for when I needed to put the sections of form back together again. Once that was done, I took the pieces of form to my work table in order to cut them into the marked sections. Before making the cuts, however, I used a set square to ensure I'd mark the form perpendicular to the back wall, as I didn't want the cuts to be at an angle. I could then use my utility knife to cut the form into the sections. I eventually ended up with a stack of pieces which were ready to cover in cork. I'd decided to use 3mm thick cork and had purchased a roll that was 10cm wide by 10m long. The form was about 1cm wider than the cork so it was important to get the cork and form oriented so that it covered the frontmost part of the form. This was achieved by turning the form upside down making sure that the front of the form remained at the, uh, front. It was then placed onto the cork strip, making sure that the left-hand edge aligned with the edge of the cork, and then a utility knife was used to cut the cork to size. I then found it helpful to mark the cork to show which was the topmost edge and the upper surface. It was also helpful to mark the form to show the extent of the cork, which indicated where glue needed to be added. Several beads of Gorilla Wood Glue were then applied to the surface of the form. Then the beads of glue were spread out up to the line using a plastic glue applicator. The cork could then be laid onto the form, and because the front of the form and the topmost edge of the cork had been marked, there was no chance of gluing the cork down the wrong way up, or the wrong way around. I then applied a bit of weight to the cork to help prevent it from lifting up before the glue did its thing. I followed this procedure until my work table was full of the tricky bit sections, all waiting for the glue to dry. Because it had been such a warm day, I'd expected the glue to go off very quickly. However, I ended up having to leave it to dry for well over 12 hours. Once eventually dry, I could then trim off any excess cork that had slipped over the edge of the form. The next job was going to be painting, so I prepared the work table in readiness for making a mess. I could then give each section of form a coat of paint. I used a brown emulsion paint in a colour called Leaf Brown, which I thought looked suitably soil-like.
I applied the paint using a sponge. I always like to use a sponge to apply paint onto larger surface areas as I think it gives you a more even covering and there's no chance of leaving bristles in the paintwork as is usually the case when using the cheap brushes that I usually have on hand. I know painting the sections wasn't strictly necessary as they'd all be off scene eventually. However, I was planning to practice my track ballasting skills as I created these sections, so having the underlying base colour that will eventually be used all over the layout seemed like a good idea. I left the sections to dry on my work table, after which it would be time to begin marking out the track and servo positions. However, that would have to happen in part two of these updates. Unfortunately, real life has got in the way and has prevented me from progressing as much as I'd have liked. But at least this crucial part of constructing Shelfington is at last underway. Just to let you know that my uploads may be a bit sporadic for the next few weeks due to the aforementioned real life happening. Hopefully though, I'll have another update on how the tricky bit is progressing sooner rather than later. As usual, if you've got any hints, tips, useful tools or techniques to pass on to a beginner in Engage modelling, or if you simply want to say hello, then please do so in the comments section. Anything and everything you've got to say will be greatly appreciated. In the meantime, thanks very much for watching. Bye.